Thomas Spirit Viking Raiders. We have in front of me a wide variety of fabrics. Most you can find at pretty much any Joann's or other fabric store, whatever you have close near to you, and everything like that. And today we're going to get into the topic of Viking Age fabrics. Now, as far as the Viking Age goes, you had two main options for fabrics if you were a Viking Age Scandinavian, as far as being able to produce yourself and make happen. As far as we can tell, there is what we call bast fiber fabrics, which is commonly known as linen. It's a fabric made from the stalk of vegetables. Now, you also have wool, which you take the hair of a sheep, you shear it, spin it, and weave it. Whereas the bast fibers, you're taking that stalk, beat on it, and then spin it. Very vague descriptions of how to do this. We will be posting videos at a later time of someone actually making linen thread and making wool thread. But for now, we're just going to get into the basics of the fabric of the Viking Age. Now, bast fibers from the Viking Age primarily come from flax linen. Part of this is because flax was a dual crop. Uh, flax produced long, non-sectioned stalks, so they would have large sections where there were straight fibers in it before it came to a little knot. If you take a look at some of the common yard grass and field grass around your home here in America, you can find big old long pieces of grass that have little fuzzy tops on them. And if you were to go outside and grab one of those, you could follow along a whole lot easier with this description. But a flax, the section in between the knots on it was very long. So the fibers in between those knots is what you're going for for making um, for making linen. The knots actually prevent you from um, make that section of the strand weaker. And so with flax, was a whole lot better for making linen with. Now, which means that you could also make it very finer. Very much so more fine, very lightweight in comparison to other bass fibers. Now, other bass fibers have been found, and I've heard speculations about hemp because hemp was everywhere. It's basically a, not scientifically, but I would say it's basically a weed bush where it just grows everywhere nonstop. Nothing kills it and everything like that. That type of weed. Not the type of weed that's normally associated with hemp. But getting off topic. Now, for Viking Age reenactors, also, there are other options for cloth that you can use if you have more influence outside of Viking Age Scandinavia. Now, some silk has been found in Scandinavia, but primarily it's in rich people's graves and everything like that. So it was definitely a high status symbol, just like it has been through most of history. And I can't imagine in the Viking Age it was any less so because the Silk Road had not been established until the Vikings made that portion of it. And eventually it got connected hundreds of years later. But... There was trade in silks and the like to the Scandinavian Vikings. But primarily, if you are going to be a reenactor and making a Viking Age kit, primarily your kits are going to be constructed out of linen and wool. Now, on to the construction of wool. 
wool, you shear it, you get all the Klingons and butt danglies and whatnot out of the wool, and then you spin it into a fiber. Now you can look at linen and wool in a different way with the Viking Age. You actually have um, two different ways of achieving this goal. By Viking Age reenactment group, there is actually a very heavy debate as to which material would have been more prevalent. Now, we know Viking Age Scandinavia was super cold, so wool was definitely required, but also, when you go raiding, you have to need some light wear. Also, in the summer for Scandinavians, you need, you know, breathable, not going to cook you out in the sun. We've had many Viking Age reenactors who will wear their wool stuff in the sun and then fall to heat injuries and the like. So we know that there was a very big mixture of the two, but which would have actually been worth more? I haven't been able to find much on the actual uh, economics between the two. Um, that's a research topic for further for the future, and probably if I ever find it, will be another video will be made on it. But when you're looking at wool and linen, yes, farmland was very scarce in Viking Age Scandinavia, but linen. It does not take much to grow it. You're basically growing grass. On top of that, when you're using flax plants, they can be packed close to each other, and they're also a dual income because on top, the linseed is good for making oils. And we know that from the Viking Age, linseed oil was a big export as well as pelts. Not so much on the wool, and linen, those were the ones that stayed close by. But also, when you're thinking about the source of wool, you're thinking about sheep. Now, a lot of people can say, oh, sheep uh, can be packed really tight and everything like that. Well, that's not actually very true. When you don't have a modern and sophisticated way of having the animals be all contained and you don't have a modern system of shearing the sheep you don't have a vast resource pool that you can pull upon whenever you run out of your personal stores of feed you would have a very hard time just keeping these sheep alive not to mention viking age scandinavia was one of the wildest places out there. And even in the Viking Age and other parts of Europe, wolves ran rampant in comparison today. In theory, you would have been able to see wolves more frequently in the Viking Age than we, in the modern age, see coyotes or possibly even deer. So a sheep was a very valuable thing. Not to mention, should it get too old, its hair not be high quality, or you just have too many, you can slaughter it for some meat. So both sources have a very high value and a dual value system. But as to which would be more common, it's hard to say just by trying to logic it out. We're going to have to do further research on it. But, as it pertains to reenactors, always have a set of wool and a set of linen. Because you never know what's going to happen and everything like that. Take care of your wool. Make sure you re-oil the wool so that it is more water resistant. When you're out in the, you know, when you are out at events and everything like that, make sure that you get some nice layers. A nice thick wool jacket will do you some very, do wonders for your various attempts at doing this reenactment in period clothing. 
Um, as far as the history of the Viking Age goes, we know from various sources that the Vikings actually placed a high value on the ability to make textiles. It was a sign of civilized people. In fact, that's part of the reason in the sagas that mention Vinland when they go over and meet the Skraelings was that they were covered in furs and uncivilized. They didn't have, you know, woven fabrics. To create fabrics, it was an astounding process. You're looking at hundreds of thousands of feet of thread all just to make a simple weaving project. Whole communities would get together to make, you know, fabric for garments because constructing a loom is hard. I've done it myself and my crappy one still took a whole lot of trial and error to make and I use modern tools to do it it would take whole communities to come together to make fabric to dye fabric we have a lot of misconceptions about the Viking Age let's get to one of them the color black the color black as far as we can tell from not only what we find in archaeology, but also just what we're able to reproduce from Viking Age Scandinavian dyes and everything like that, black was not possible. Yes, you could take a blue dye and get it very, very close to black, but it's still blue. The black fabrics found in, from Viking Age Scandinavia were all silk. There is a reenactor out there selling Viking Age period dyed wool that is black. He says he was able to achieve it through a mixture of dyes. And I'd really like to get his recipe and try it for myself or at least if he could publish a research paper on what he did, I'd like to do that because that opens up a whole new option for reenactors. But as far as we can tell right now from all the research I've done and many of the people that I know who are, I would say experts within the Viking age, including professors from on YouTube and Reenactors who have been doing this for 30 plus years who have dove into the specifics of fiber production during the Viking Age say that black was not an option. Now, here you have another topic about the Viking Age that a lot of people don't know about, the color pink. I actually have an example right here. Okay? Pink was actually one of the hardest to achieve colors for the Viking Age because it required you to gather up, kill, dry, and crush up thousands upon thousands of beetles just for the, to, to be able to dye the tiniest amount of fabric. The darker the pink, the better, of course. But pink has been found in noblemen's graves and what would be epitomized as warrior graves. It was a very high status symbol and we actually have resources all throughout history from ancient Egypt, I'm assuming, I heard it once from another reenactor so I don't know how valid it is, but all throughout history, I know definitely in the Romans, all the way up until just before World War I, we have constant reference to boys in pink and girls in dainty blue. So 
when we're looking at the Viking Age, which was a very warrior-driven society, warriors of Scandinavians during the Viking Age were highly prized. So you actually go out there having, if we were to travel back in time and go find some of the greatest warriors of the time, they looked like something straight out of a cancer awareness, you know, cancer awareness parade. So we have a few of those misconceptions about the Viking Age. Um, some of the dyes, a common dye for the Viking Age would have been blue. Blue is everywhere. Another common would have been brown. Brown comes from boiling the fruit of the walnut tree. And I'm not just talking about the nuts. They don't have nuts that just fall down. They come down in apple-sized fruits. And basically that fruit portion is poisonous to humans unless you boil it off. So brown fabrics were likely a very common thing because producing the dye also produces a storable and renewable food source, high in protein, tasty in oatmeal, which all is very important to a Viking Age Scandinavian because, forgive the pop culture reference, but winter is coming and that was likely a mantra of theirs because winters were harsh in Viking Age Scandinavia. So packing in those being able to store calories was important. So, but also why would you waste the dye? So while they're sitting there boiling, you know, walnuts just to store away for the winter, likely they were dyeing fabric with it as well, getting it super concentrated to make a nice dark brown dye. And, they, and all the households that were doing this would save their concentrated dye and bring it together and then they would dye their mass-produced textiles. Another thing about the Viking Age that is related to fabrics that not a whole lot of people know about was the fine culture of fabrics. Most people are used to straight up you know, standard textile weave that you see in things like duck claw, canvas, and everything like that. But the Vikings actually had a very sophisticated array of weaves that bring life to the fabric. I can attest, having been a reenactment, uh, in reenact Viking Age reenactment now for five years, that the weave of the fabric is super important to reenactors. It shows a level of care. It denotes purpose. Heavily patterned weaves would be more for looking nice and everything like that. But not only that, but certain ones provide strength in areas. Then you have felted fabrics more for like a work shirt and everything like that. Being able to go to a Viking Age reenactment and seeing the wide usage of the fabrics is just astounding. You have many different types of weaves. You have chevrons, both broken and whole. Broken meaning that the patterns do not line up. So when you have the chevron, regular chevron, this whole point, uh, pattern would be black while broken this side would be what let, let's say not black uh, this would be one color let's say green and then on the broken instead of it alternating between let's say green and yellow it would actually be green on this side yellow on this side then the next one down it would be yellow on this green on this so it's alternating you also have diamond weave, which looks exactly like it sounds. It looks like 
basically a tiny little diamond progressively getting bigger in multiple steps and then that pattern repeated all over the fabric. Broken diamond, where again, because the diamond is just like the chevron in the fact that it's a two color thing, you would have the diamond be much like this and then on the broken, one side would be green, one side would be orange, or realistically, a true broken would actually be that instead of being shaped like this, it would kink down so that the whole, basically the whole line of diamonds is shifted one direction. We had um, pre-Viking Age, but I've seen some Viking Age reenactors use a dog tooth weave. And pretty much everybody knows dog tooth weave. It's a popular thing now and was back in the 90s, so I'm not going to bother to explain that. You also have what I call Viking plaid. Now, heavy plaid was popular throughout history, throughout the centuries, in different areas. But a Viking Age plaid would often be very subtle in color change as well as pattern change it would be almost it wouldn't look like plaid from a distance but when you got close you could see the tiny little squares and occasional off color lines um, generally not having more than three colors as far as i've researched i've seen one with four different colors but they were very subtle and different. You're not looking at like the, you know, standard, what's called Scottish tartan, the red, green, blue, yellow, that just slaps you in the face. You could see it from space without a telescope type of plaid. We're talking about different shades of brown and tan. We're talking about yellow and green and everything like that. Something that would be more akin to modern camouflage. Likely it was used for camouflage in many instances like hunting and whatnot. But it was all very natural colors that sort of just blended in together. So as of right now, that concludes my video on having a look into the history of Viking Age fabrics and just kind of a sneak peek for the next video that I'm going to be doing is more heavily reenactor based. But what it is, is it's the ability to ascertain the difference between fabrics, both modern and historical, and also have some useful links as to where you can get and find and possibly even make sure you're buying the right material as a reenactor. It will also give some decent options as how to make your kit or if you're just doing a viking age comp cosplay for a ren fair how to make it as authentic as possible without breaking your bank so as for right now until then let's get this done and i hope you guys had enjoyed this video uh please like subscribe and hit that bell to follow me and get you know more notifications on these videos and I hope that you guys continue to watch and learn about the Viking Age and become passionate about history.